Messi. Oh, what a goal it is! Hi, uh, I'm Shazwan Wong from Little League Soccer, uh, and you guys are listening to Bola Bola Show. Hey everyone, and it's time for the Bola Bola Show again. Thank you as always for checking us out here at all your favorite post- podcasting sites and also on YouTube. So it's me, Elvin here, and as usual, you know, with me are my two usual suspects. We have been partners in crime for more than 20 over years. The one and the only, Bala and Steven. So, Mr. Bala, apa macam? Hi, Elvin. Thanks for bringing me inside. It's been a while uh, with the MCO condition and things are getting better. How about you, Steven? Hopefully, things are very good with you. Yeah, things are all good with me. I mean, uh, pretty much, as you mentioned, MCOs are beginning to open up a little bit. You know, things are picking up here and there. And, of course, you know, the conversation of football doesn't end. And we have an interesting guest on our show today, right, Bala? Oh, yes. He's none other than Shazwan Wong uh, from the Little League Soccer General Manager. Uh, nice to welcome you, Shazwan Wong. Can you, can you give us more of your background and uh, what do you do, actually? Uh, uh, thanks for inviting me for, for a start. And uh, I'm the general manager of Little League Soccer. Uh, we run youth football right. training. And basically, for Little League Soccer, uh, we have uh, various departments where we coach at schools, uh, we coach a development program on the weekends, and then also we also coach the elite program on the weekdays as well. Mm-hmm. I see. Okay. Mm. Uh, of course, uh, you know, being a coach, you know, when always uh, when people talk about football coach, it's always uh, the aspiration is always want to coach at a higher level, coaching you know professional or semi professional clubs. But yeah. in your case, you know, I mean, what made you decided to go on in towards grassroots coaching? I mean, what was the inspiration for you behind this decision? Uh, basically, I started at the very bottom. Uh, when I first uh, reached China uh, with my wife, uh, mm-hmm. I stumbled upon coaching by chance, actually. And basically, my very first session is coaching a bunch of four and five years old, five years old kids. So that's my very start. And then all the while I was in China, I'm involved in a new football as well. Until I came back to Malaysia in 2009 to join Little League Soccer. And basically it stuck there. Uh, I would say like I, I had never had any, how do you say, it, uh, ambition to go to that pro level. Uh, probably one thing is because there's always uh, uncertainty on it. I would say. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, that's really interesting. Uh, really yeah, especially when you see you see in the local football scene, uh, when when you heard about those unpaid salaries and those mm-hmm. like year by year contract, uh, mm-hmm. uh, it's a bit it's a bit unstable to be honest with you. Ah, okay, okay. I mean, mm-hmm. understood. Yep. Uh, it, it it is uh, pretty much a concern for everyone who wants to be involved in professional football, especially yes, in Yeah. All right. Yeah, okay. Talking about grassroots training, I think uh, from our observation, we see in the Padang or even the Futsal Court, there's numerous uh, players have interests and a uh, lot of ambition in the style, the move. We have quality. It doesn't matter what race, Indian, Chinese, maybe. The passion yes. is there. But uh, where are we lagging actually if we compare to the top nations like Europe or even Japan in Asia? Where, where is the stumbling block? And, but for what I see, basically, we can compete with them, especially in the Younger, younger age, but when it's come to the, when it comes to the training, we are still lagging far behind, especially in the, in the, in the, in the field. Is there any other why from experience? I, mean, I, uh, I haven't been to Japan, and basically, I really can't comment about coaching styles and stuff like that. Uh, but I think there are two points that I see we are lacking. Is uh, 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 number one is football culture. I, I don't think the football mm. culture is here yet. Uh, especially when you look at... In Japan, I know kids as young as 8 years old are training uh, 5 times a week with a match on the wow. weekend. Mm-hmm. And I think that like, same goes to the European countries as well. But back home in Malaysia, when I first came back uh, with Little League Soccer, uh, at that time, that structure is not there yet. We're still like more or less like weekend club training. Uh, we, are, we, we do train on weekdays as well, but it's compared to what we are doing now, it's very different. Uh, I mean, like, we can see like, how many youth clubs in KL actually like, is training on weekdays as well. 
like for us in FCKL uh, on for the eight years old and ten years old, eight to twelve actually, we are training every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And for the okay. older boys, uh, the thirteen and above, all the way to eighteens, they are actually training four times a week, uh, Monday to Thursday, with the league games on the weekend as well. So mm-hmm. we are trying to improve on that. And I also remember when I, uh, in the mid, I would say about 2013 and 2014, it is not easy to convince the parents to come back out uh, to train on the weekdays. Because basically, during that time, it's basically like you come down on a Saturday and Sunday and then that's it. But now, like, we're trying to implement training on the weekdays. It is it, a process uh, to convince the parents, like, we need to train more in order to improve. <laughs> and the second point I would say uh, Coaching education uh, Especially for grassroots From what I see like it, I think it's a bit lacking here in uh, Malaysia we, we do have those uh, regularly the, the C license, the B license And stuff like that But I don't think that is 100% tailor made for youth coaching It's very different <laughs> Hmm. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, so uh, Shazwan, you know, in uh, in Malaysia, you know, even though uh, you know we love many sports, you know, namely like badminton, squash, bowling, hockey, tennis, etc. But when it comes to one sport, you know, football is the the most favorite sport among Malaysian, right? Yeah. And you know, d- despite having a huge population, you know, a, a pool of more than, you know, let, let's look about thirty over million people, and of course, lots of youth. Yeah, all involved there as well, you know. But there's always an uh, issue about struggling to find suitable talent, you see, as compared to other countries with far less population than us mm-hmm. and having much more success in this sport. So, you know, where, where do you think the problem lies here? You know, do, do you think there is, a, there is a gap from bridging between grassroots to structured training level at, at, to get into senior level and all that? Uh, I think that might be the case, to be honest with you. Uh, when you look at the Amnic teams, uh, you can see like not many actually have an academy. I mean, like correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I think Selangor is starting one. JD, JDT mm-hmm. have one that is pretty successful. Uh, I know for a fact Kedah also, if I'm not mistaken, have one. But is there any like proper structure like we see at the Premier League or? In Germany, where these youth clubs have like a proper structure from, from from the area moving all the way up to a certain club, right? I don't I don't think we have a solid structure as they are, mm. which I think that will that's affecting the development of the boys anymore uh, a little bit, mm-hmm. because uh I, I mean like, uh where can we see a clear pathway for youth players? Let's say he joins a club. Like even like for now, if you join us as uh, for Little League, right? Yeah. Uh, they can see the pathway from development moving up to the elite level, which is the FCKL. We got 8, 9, 10 years old, all the way to 18. But mm-hmm. after 18, where do they go? Uh, that would be the main question, I would say. Mm-hmm. Hmm, okay. Let's talk about parents then. Uh, when I was youth, uh, I remember at one tournament I went, I was uh, representing Slango in Taekwondo. Uh, mm-hmm. I was preparing for mm-hmm. a national. I was, was saying open in uh, Pandamara at the time. So before yeah. I go, I, my parents, my father looked at me and looked because of the size game here. He told me that where are you going? I said, going for a tournament here. And then he told me back, uh, this matter will give you rice or not in, in, in Tamil language. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, of course, I went and came back with the gold medal. I still remember that. <clears throat> but uh, I think after SPM, I stopped and I went to Super and I stopped in 2002. Uh, from what I'm yeah. experience, basically, I think parents is the fundamental, uh, important or character in these children growth. So, actually, from your experience, how does how does parent role in player development affect them, and uh, what can they do to develop more in the uh, to develop the grassroots level, especially? I I think it's very important. I mean, like I think probably we grew up in the same era where our parents doesn't like us to do to sports. I used to hide my boots inside my bag. Back and telling the parents I'm going for tuition, but instead actually I'm going for football training. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I think I think it's very important. Uh, end of the day, it is the parents that pay the fees. Uh, to join any some, I mean, like for now we are talking like uh, parents are are the one that's paying the fees. 
uh, parents will be the one that will be bringing the kids to the training ground. Sometimes, like, uh, actually, we do have parents that have uh, siblings in our club where they are actually at come down to our football field from Monday to Saturday, excluding Saturday and Sunday matches as well. Basically, these parents are, are quite committed in taking their boys uh, for training and football matches. I think that is very, very important. And through my experience uh, in this youth development, sometimes we do, we do have some talent players, talented players. But because of lack of support from the parents, where the parents are always busy uh, not being able to take them for training, they are the one that is actually suffering, the kid itself, because they can't attend any trainings, which slowly, in time, they will be uh, not improving as much as the other players that is coming. I think like parents' involvement is, is quite crucial as well in the early days of the football development. Hmm, okay, okay. And the fact that you mentioned that parents are paying the fees, I mean, yeah. what is, what is the, uh, the fees level like in Malaysia when it comes to sending kids to go for grassroots coaching? Do you think it's reasonable and affordable by Malaysian football standard? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, mean, I, can't, I can't say I can't represent every club in KL because I think uh, most of us have different price structure. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do know like some clubs charge 50 to 60 ringgit a month to train on the weekends only. Okay. Uh, we ourselves charge 120 on the weekends. Uh, and then those who are training with the elite setup, they are paying between 185 ringgit to 200 ringgit for three to four sessions a week. Oh, okay. okay. So like there's, there's various price that uh, which like our price range falls to about 10 ringgit for a session, which is an hour and a half for the elite players. And for the development players, it's slightly higher. Uh, it's about 15 ringgit per hour. I think like, but I do know also clubs that charge seven to 800 ringgit for a term, which is the, they charge per, uh, per three months. So different clubs have different price structure, I think based on their operating costs as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. But, so, but uh, I will, I will yeah. want to say, like, I, uh, in Malaysia, I think we are still by far one of the cheapest around. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if we compare to our neighbors in Singapore, I think the price there is even higher. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, in terms of fees, payment for sports. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, uh, you know, since we are still talking about parents, so, you know, the, the pay master, the parent, right? So, he pays yeah. you, he puts his kid into your, your academy and they go through the training and all that. So, then when it comes to like, you know, uh, wanting to get their kids in for a starting gig, you know, like get them mm -hmm. in the starting lineup or prominent role, maybe wanting to be named as a team captain or something like that because they are <laughs> paying, you know, the, the, you know this, this sort of parental uh, pressure on you. So, so... Yeah. How, I mean, how do you cope with this kind of situation, such as one? Uh, so far, uh, in our club setup, because we have this structure of from a development moving to elite, a uh, problem like this is quite less. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll tell you about my experience uh, later on. Okay. Like now, for Little League Soccer, those guys that are training on the weekends, right? Uh, every month, we, are, we set up like a inter-center friendly matches where we split these kids into small groups where every play, everyone plays in equal time. So they get equals match time. So there are no questions about he's not playing, who's not playing, who's playing less and whatnot. As for FC Kuala Lumpur, which is elite and competitive, kids will have to fight for their places. We made it very clear to the parents at the start of the season when they are selected. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't guarantee equal time uh, during matches because end of the day even though we are talking about youth development like when we go onto the pitch you still want to achieve some results right so yep. but there will be no kids will be sitting out and not playing at all that one we are not allowing to happen to all our coaches at some point the kids have to go onto the pitch and play if they are called up for the lineup or on a match day uh, mm -hmm. it's just like Either they play less or they play more, that will reflect back on their training sessions. And then the coach will make a decision how much time that he's going to be playing. 
but then if you calculate it throughout the season, they will be playing almost at the same amount of time. Because like, let's say if you're playing against some lesser teams where in the first half, we are four or five nil up. So mm-hmm. usually that is the time that we bring in the fringe players and get them have a more game time compared to the first team players. Like, I believe like in, in football setup, mm. uh, most teams will have like three or four main players, right? Yeah. Where these are the players like you get your results and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But if, if you're on a day like if in the first half, you're four or five nil up, then that's when the subs get the runs out uh, more than the first team players. Mm. So back to the experience that I'm going to tell you, like I remember early on when, I, when we started this uh, elite setup, uh, uh, there's one parent that actually sponsoring the, the club mm-hmm. where we are preparing to go for a tournament outside of KL. Okay. And he is questioning why my kid is not selected mm-hmm. when I'm your sponsor. So, <laughs> it, put us, it put me in a tough spot, actually. But how I reason to him is like, this is a competitive team. Uh, he will get another chance in another tournament. And end of the day, if I bring him along, which other parents can see like why I'm practicing favoritism, because everyone can see like he's not at that level yet, right? Mm. So if I bring him on, I might have to answer to another 15, 16 parents about this mm-hmm. selection process. Mm-hmm. So I might as well just answer to one, listen to him, the good thing like he understands and then in the next tournament, the boy is selected, so it's not a problem. Mm. So, so, so that must have been quite a tricky situation to, to handle. It's very tricky actually. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 the thing I could I could imagine. But but just now when you were mentioning about uh, substitutions and all that, so I I suppose there is no like limitations to substitutions bringing in guys in and out during uh, matches, giving them chance to play. Yep. Uh, basically, in new football, uh, is on rolling subs. So you can bring a player in, bring a player out, bring him back in, and stuff like that. Mm. And mm. to ensure the boys like get ample match time mm-hmm. usually we bring about between 10 to 12 players maximum mm-hmm. so let's ensure like all the boys like get good match time on the weeks okay all right mm. all right all right now of course uh, you know uh, every particular uh, club so you know uh, or maybe even at grassroots level i'm sure they have their sort of model or sort of methodology which they they want to adopt uh, when implementing on their training uh, schedule. So, in, in from your from your case, I mean, where where do you draw your influence? I mean, is there any particular country that you look up to uh, in terms of how you know they develop th- their grassroots programs and all that? Uh, uh, when I first started coaching, actually, I coached with uh, a few coaches from United, uh, US, and I have to say, like they are very, very good in, especially in coaching uh, youth football in terms of uh, having a fun team in the in your session. So they are combining fun stuff uh, in terms of uh, learning a football skills. So I learn a lot from there uh, that I use for my development training. As for elite, uh, actually, I draw a lot of inspiration from Barcelona. Uh, <laughs> Mm-hmm. I watch a lot of their videos. Uh, actually, I watch a lot of their under nines, under tens videos that is on YouTube. Uh, mm-hmm. I just enjoy watching it, and I envision my boys can play that way uh, one day. But overall, actually, I can't. How do you say? It? I can't take everything from there and implement it here, because. Mm-hmm. Uh, the ability of the players are different from different countries, right? Even if you're talking about uh, mentality as well, I think it's very different from in Spain and compared to the boys in, in Malaysia. So what we can do is like we, we try to gain ideas from there and tweak it so it's applicable over here. So I think uh, that, that that is one of my, how do you say it, like, inspired me uh, to coach the boys here. All right. So, talking about boys, I think from, from, from my experience, 
what is the ideal age actually to really develop a grassroots player? And also, how far are we in Malaysia from the best countries in grassroots development? And um, is there anything is done to promote this more on public school level? From from what I see, and also I think you can agree with me, uh, especially in public school, I think there's much much development on this matter. Yeah, I think uh, uh, school is the best place to find players. I would say. Uh, because all the kids go to these schools, right? So for grassroots program, I think the best place to start is at the school. But the question is like, do we have enough coaches to do that? Uh, that that's one thing. Do we have enough resources to do that? Uh, that's another. As, as for your questions about when is the best age to start, I would say as soon as they can walk, to be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> I'm a firm believer of uh, football starts from home. Uh, mm-hmm. I followed one of these uh, top coach, uh, Tom Bayer, Tom Bayer uh, quite yeah. closely. And yeah, he's always preaching about football should start from home. Mm. And actually, it's true. Uh, a kid that has been in contact with the ball from an early age, and when they come down to a structured football session, it is a lot easier for us to coach. Mm. The, this, is, this is all about the contact time with the ball, I would say. Like as early as possible, just for them to play around with the ball in the house, just kick about and stuff like that. That that helps massively. And what was the question after that? Uh, no, how about the school level? Is there anything can be done to promote this in school level, public school level? Because I think the, yeah, the school, level, school level, like, level, I think even the teachers are not sure having a proper proper what they call the knowledge in this to develop players. Yeah, that is, that is the problem that we heard every day, isn't it? When the yeah. teachers are actually coaching a team where they have no, how do you say it, like a proper knowledge about, about football coaching. But I said like yeah. coaching schools is the best place to, to go to because all the kids go to school. Uh, it's just like, do we have enough coaches and do we have enough resources to do that? That's, mm-hmm. that's another. So that is, that is something for our sports department, uh, sports ministry to think about. But then they can open up this too, like, you know, sometimes for maybe to outsiders, uh, maybe who want to do in freelance, you know, maybe what do for free, but just to coach the students or children, if the school teachers are occup- preoccupied with this kind of, uh, maybe academy, is that right? Yeah, yeah, uh, some, some schools are implementing that. Uh, okay. I do know a few local schools that's actually doing that, where they hire uh, outside contractors, I call it, to come down mm-hmm. and coach football. Mm-hmm. Uh, at one point, I was coaching uh, Sri KDU oh, okay. uh, for the school team. We run the development program and then we also coach the school team. There, there are a few schools open, open to that, uh, how do you say, to that model. Mm-hmm. Uh, where, but then, end of the day, it, it's down to the headmaster, isn't it? Yeah. Is, is he, is he re- really interested in football to allow that? So, the powers is uh, in their hands, actually to allow or not to allow outside coaches and co- uh, to come and coach at the schools. Hmm. So a lot, a lot of uh, decision comes down to the headmaster. Uh. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's true. And, and to your question, I think I remember now when you asked how, how, far, how far are us compared to uh, Good countries. Developed countries, isn't it? Like Spain so, and Germany. So uh, I think like before MCO, Actually, uh, I managed to send one player for trials at JDT for the under uh, under sixteen, under eight, under seventeen team. Okay. Actually, oh. so I have a quick chat with their head coach, which is from Valencia. So obviously, he got that experience coaching in Spain and stuff like that. So what he was saying is like our football here, in terms of the youth players, mm-hmm. not the, not the national level. Yep, the youth players. Probably he was talking about his boys comparing to what he has in Spain. Uh, he said we are two years behind. Two years. What he say? Yeah, two years behind. Meaning our under-18 boys are playing similar as their under-16 boys down there. Our under-12 boys here probably playing similar to their under-10s. It's the same standard of the under-10s across down there. So, mm. if he's speaking from, in terms of his experience with JDT, right, where they, they are two years behind, and that is a pretty high-level team down there. So, <laughs> if, we go down, if we go down to the level to us, the private clubs, uh, I think we are like 
probably four years behind, I would say. Oh, okay. That's mm-hmm. interesting because, like, uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we went to Eber Cup last year with our under nines, uh, under 12, if I'm not mistaken, and our under 15 team. And you can see their physical and technical level is just two or three levels on top of us. It is it, it, a it's a uh, quite a gap down there actually. Uh, uh, Shazwan, would you want to just uh, uh like uh, inform our listeners again? What what cup was this again? Uh, Iber Cup in Portugal. Ah, okay. Oh, okay. Iber Cup. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's an international youth tournament. Yeah, it's an international youth tournament where mm. there are clubs come from all over Europe and uh even from US as well, South America. And mm. to be honest, we are those boys from France, like uh, the African players. Mm-hmm. Like physically, they are just like dominating everything. You are talking from a very oh, young yeah. age, and mm. and when you look at those teams from Spain and Portugal, yeah, uh, uh, they are more more of a technical player. They they mm-hmm. they don't have the physical. They don't have the physical. You can see, kids are probably smaller than our boys. But there is just no way to touch them or get near to them. It okay. is just like a few levels above us. I, I, I mean, I, I think this, this whole thing about uh, raising up the level also, I think comes down to decision making, right? How, how quick these kids can, can, like, you know, when, when the ball is at your feet, right? Yeah, yeah. What, 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 yeah. what, what do you do with it in like split second, right? I, this, this is where I think uh, our, our we, we also lack compared to, you know, the, the more established nations, I think. So yeah, I think uh, FAM also have tweaked their syllabus a little bit. Uh, I think mm-hmm. they are trying to create thinking players. Where, mm-hmm. where now, uh, I would say coaches, instead of giving instructions during training session, I think mm-hmm. it's more on asking questions now. Like, if a kid player pass to this area here, yep. Yep. which is intercepted, instead of telling him to pass there, we can ask like, ask him. okay, you play the pass there, but what can be better? Where can you mm. pass it better? So yeah, the kids have looked around, oh, I should pass down there. Yeah. So then mm. when they start thinking, when they start answering questions from you, mm. I think that will help uh, in terms of uh, when the player is playing, they are starting thinking about solutions. Yeah, exactly. So they don't get panicked when, when, you know, when it's like a one-on-one, a defender running to them, they, they know exactly what to do. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, correct. In, in in all those situations they've been put through, yeah, yeah. So, End of the day, all of this come through a process. Uh, mm-hmm. Like I said earlier, I think the training times is very important. Even like I'm currently coaching my under nine under nine team, mm-hmm. where for me, three times a week, uh, it's not enough. Uh, I would love to coach them four to five times a week, mm. but but like I said, we have to take this slowly because this is. Uh, eventually will affect the parents' commitment as well. Where are they willing to stray away from three times? Are they willing to send the kids five times a week? I mean, like financially, mm. I don't think it's a problem for them to pay. It's just mm. like the time to take the kids from school, back home, shower, have their lunch or whatever, yeah. and then straight to training. Yeah. I think I think that's a that's a commitment that every, uh, these parents have to be in, and like for our nation to. To be to be in that culture, I mm. think it would take some time. Yeah, and and I'm I think pretty sure some of these kids have more than just the football training in their on their plate, right? They have probably school tuition and all lots of other yes, piano, yeah, yeah, whatever, so, yeah. So sometimes parents, in a way, tend to burn out their kids by just letting them try and do everything. And uh, uh, actually, we do we do we do have kids like sometimes turn up in mm-hmm. training. We can see like these kids are tired. Uh, yeah. and I then when we so. ask like oh yeah I just did one hour of streaming and then one hour of <laughs> athletics I mean like obviously after two hours of these sports and then you come for football training which is a little yeah. last part of exercise of the day you, yeah. you are naked you are, you are tired yeah. <laughs> so what we advise the parents like if, if they really want to concentrate on football uh, if they really want to do well in football I think at the age of probably 10, 11 years old they might need to start pick one sport and concentrate on it so mm. they can be better. Yep. 
Hmm. Yep, yep. Okay, interesting. So, uh, Shazwan, you know, all of us now are going through this uh, difficult and challenging time of the movement control <laughs> order, you know, due to this COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, I, I think it, it has a huge impact on your training programs, you know. And uh, how do, you know, coaches like you cope in these last few months, you know, were you guys organizing anything online on Zoom and, uh, and all that with the kids? Uh, yeah, uh, from the start of MCO, actually, we mm. continue with our training. Uh, indoors, we, did, we didn't go out. We do it via Zoom online. Uh-huh. Uh, okay. We still keep our training times where like the 12 and below still doing three times a week. And the older boys are still doing four to five times a week on Zoom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, but it's very limited to what we can do. Yeah, uh, yeah. Basically, we are just doing bow mastery uh, reaction exercise. We, mm-hmm. we, we can't even do like passing as well because some of them like stay in apartments. You, you don't want to start getting <laughs> yeah. complaints yeah. of balls banging into the walls every <laughs> single time. So yeah. I think it's quite a challenge. It's very new to all of us mm-hmm. uh, coaching football online. But I think after, after a few weeks, we start to get the hang out of it. We, we, we start to create uh, better sessions to challenge the boys uh, at home. Mm-hmm. But I think at some point, at some point, the players and us coaches might mm-hmm. get burned out from this coaching online. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, it is quite difficult. Like, end of the day, like all want to go back to outdoors. Yeah, yeah, I would. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I would think so as well. Yeah. Yep. And uh, and that that is why Shazwan, you're really hoping for good news tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, the day, like people, people say like uh, for this MCO, we need to start to live with the virus. It's gonna mm-hmm. be everything will be new norm and stuff like that. For mm-hmm. me, football can't be a new norm. Uh, it just yeah, can't. because uh, it's because you can't you, you you <laughs> if you social imagine social distancing in football, you know it's going to be a yeah. basketball score, right? The game. Yeah, like for a start, if they allow us to go back to train with social distance outdoor, I'm very mm-hmm. happy, man. Compared mm-hmm. to doing it online. Mm-hmm. But yep. to say football is going to get a new norm in this and that, I don't think that will happen because end of the day, football is a team sport. Football is a contact sport. It, it can't be done with any other way. Mm-hmm. It, it has to go back to the old way. So like, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, if you compare to, I heard uh, darts are doing it online now. Uh, darts competition. Mm-hmm. Like individual sports, yes, I, I understand. Like you can change from being, uh, getting together and do the sports if it's uh, individual like darts or what else can we do online on their own, which does not affect. Like probably archery, I would say that that you yeah. can do it, do it, do it uh, on yourself, no problem. Yeah. Like football will never have a new norm. That's for sure. Mm. <laughs> I mean, uh, we, are, we, are, we are watching, uh, you know, some of the leagues which have resumed. And to be yeah, honest, sometimes yeah. it's, it's very funny to see players, you know, they don't, they, they social distance themselves in the tunnel, they social distance themselves in the bench, <laughs> they social distance themselves <laughs> when they're celebrating a goal. But when it comes to taking free kick, everybody's lined up like stick to each other. <laughs> At the wall, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's very weird. So I'm like, hey, wait a minute. I mean, what's uh, the point of all this then? <laughs> I mean, my yeah. mindset, we just yeah. get on with it since we want to start all that. I mean, my mindset, we just get on with it, right? <laughs> yeah, hopefully everything will get back to normal. Like, uh, football needs to get back to normal. It, it is part of our life, isn't it? To those who are involved in football, regardless. If you are a fan or you are a sports writer, you are a player, coach, I think, like, football needs to get back to normality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, but at, at least, you know, now you, you with, this uh, COVID-19 as well when you guys have gone through the Zoom training and all. Yeah. Perhaps when you all go back to normally where you can train, you you have an option that you can still do things online as well on the field, you know, like like you can mix around yeah. things because, because you have experience doing it online already. Something you probably would not have thought of maybe last year, right? Yes, like, yes. No, I, didn't, I, I don't think anyone have thought of coaching football online. Yeah, uh, exactly. Before start. Before, <laughs> yeah. But... But so, it's the new skills that we learn. Mm. It's the new skills that we learn. And, and you can see like quite a fair bit of people doing uh, 
online sessions as well that cater for the mass market. I, I do know that's one one guy in Australia which quite got quite huge uh, doing online session on YouTube actually. I think he may make uh, good money out of it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but then like I said, he's on into one-on-one coaching and basic techniques coaching. Yeah. But then when it comes back to team training, where you go for competition and stuff like that, that that's mm-hmm. a completely different story. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, true, true. Okay. Uh, and of course, I was wondering, uh, following you on Twitter, I've noticed... Uh, how I put it. It's not really a rant, but it's sort of like you've been questioning the government of the day on coming out with a lack of, uh, you know, SOPs for coaches like yourself on how you guys can actually resume training in the post uh, MCO period when things started to loosen up. And I think uh, even for yourself, even yeah. until, I suppose even until today, uh, I mean, the current phase is supposed to end on this coming Monday, if I, correct me if I'm wrong. And even until now, there is no sort of guidance for how you guys can actually do. I mean, would you like to share more on this? I mean, I'm sure all of us here, especially Elwin and Bala, you would like to you know, listen a lot on this. Yeah, uh, it's a bit frustrating, uh, especially when we don't have any guidelines, when we can come out, what can we do? Uh, and then when you see at the other footballing countries, they are slowly coming back out with... Uh, trainings in small groups and stuff like that. So, so I end up asking questions like, why can't we do that? And, and when they start opening up the malls and stuff, it's like, why can't we go out to train at the pitch? Uh, why people can go jogging? Why can't we train? So I think that's a, the perspective of football uh, was a bit unjustified, I would say, where they think of football is straight away the contact sports, but they did not think of if it's a training, it's a controlled environment where, where you can social distance players. Uh, we, we tried to come out actually a few weeks ago. We, we, we did ask, we prepared an SOP mm-hmm. uh, where half a pitch, we have four players in with one coach in the middle. So we are talking about each player is in a 25 meters times 25 meters zone. Mm. And they have their own ball. So, <laughs> We are not even changing, uh, interchanging balls and stuff like that. So one player, one ball. Basically, we are transferring what we do in Zoom onto the training pitch where they're still training individually. But at least it's outdoors. But unfortunately, the authorities think like, uh, we can't do that because it's football. So, so that's why I make quite a fair bit of noise on Twitter as well. Like, uh, yeah, but, but- I was so... Our social- Social distancing is far way better than going to the malls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, 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 but these guys, these, these guys that, that you know, that shut down the idea and all that, do you think is it because it's, they, they have the mindset it's football or, is, or their concern are more because it's like kids or, or, or younger, younger, you know, younger kids? Because I think the, the senior guys and all that... Uh, are going to start back their training, right? Like FAM and yeah. if I'm not mistaken, yeah. I think I think it's down to football. Mm-hmm. Uh, because when they think about, I mean, we can't blame them, mm-hmm. especially when the instructions from the top is, it is stated very clearly, football is not allowed. Mm-hmm. So uh, we can't blame them because like, they are not in the football business. They are not football people. Mm-hmm. So you can't, you can't like think that they would understand what is football is. Mm-hmm. So I think like when, when they come out to say football is not allowed, I think most people are, especially the authorities, even though like we, we spoke to one of the authorities, he said like, I understand what you guys are doing. There's good social distance and stuff like that. Uh, each player having their own equipments. Uh, but then, uh, the instruction is football is not allowed. Mm-hmm. So, so we have to cancel off our training and go back online. So hopefully uh, by tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow uh, 3 p.m. Yeah, <laughs> at, le- at least we can come back out and do trainings in small groups with social distance as, as has been done in US, has been done in Australia as well. 
uh, mm. where kids really come back out to train in social distance way, mm-hmm. where they have their own zones and yeah, that that will help help massively. That will slowly restart our football. Yeah. Actually, it's a very good point that you highlight about these countries because like Germany also started their league, and you also mentioned yeah. about Australia recently. And then why actually Malaysia, especially why can't we adopt to this kind of countries uh, SOPs to yeah. interest in Malaysia? Yeah, there are examples that you can follow. I think mm-hmm. I posted in Twitter. It's like that. There's mm-hmm. a lot of examples that you can take on from these countries, mm-hmm. and and tweak it to suit our needs here. Yep. But uh, I just saw the news like FM have met up with KBS four times already. Mm-hmm. So hopefully something good is coming out tomorrow. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. I mean, uh, just just in case if our listeners are wondering, you know, why is it tomorrow? Tomorrow, but because we are recording. On the 6th of June. So, as some of you all know, by the time you all listen to this episode, probably there will be some good news on the 7th of June as the Prime Minister will make uh, some announcements. So, you know, let's look forward to that and wait and see. But I, I guess, uh, Shazwan, you know, as you mentioned, you know, probably culture also plays a role in terms of why yeah. these countries are willing to react fast because, you know, football is a very important essential in their daily life. You know, it's almost as good as wanting to yeah. have a good meal on the table. It, it is yeah. part of their life, isn't it? It's part yeah. of their life. Yeah. And, you know, for us still, we're having that gap between, trying to bridge that gap between a culture and a sport. That's why I always say, yeah. that people, you know, if, if in order totally for people to progress, you. if you treat it as a favorite pastime, you're not going to go anywhere. But if you treat it like, per se, as a religion, then, you know, you can see why some countries do extremely well in football. Because it is yeah. sort of like a second religion to them. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Very, very true. Yeah. They live and breathe football. Yeah. All right, true. All right. So let's go to the fun part, then have a serious tone. Uh, I think you're a Liverpool fan. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you're very, very happy that they are currently just two wins away from uh, lifting up the uh, Bakke Premier League. Uh, yeah. I think it's maybe about 30, 30 long wait years. And then, unfortunately, what Pep Gorilla couldn't do in Manchester City, Corona did, whereby they postponed the new celebration. <laughs> <laughs> but having said hey, that, having said he's that, still going to Liverpool regardless. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I heard you as well. But then the, new, the, but then the good news for you is the league starting on uh, June the 17th, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And, uh, so how, how do you feel right now? Uh, it's great. It's great to see football back, to be honest with you. I mean, like, I've been watching the K-League, watching the Bundesliga as well. Uh, it, it has to come back to normal. And hopefully when Premier League restarts and hopefully when our Malaysian League restarts and then uh, hopefully the World Cup qualifiers uh, has been announced, right? It's going to happen in October and November, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, yep. And hopefully slowly we'll, we'll, we'll go back to normal. Yep. I mean, so are you looking forward to finally that Premier League trophy is going to be lifted by Liverpool? Yeah, sadly, it's not going to be in front of the fans uh, for sure. It's going to be weird. I would <laughs> say lifting a trophy in an empty stadium. So I, I, I'm not sure how they're going to organize that. But a trophy is a trophy, a win is a win. Yeah. And hopefully, we'll do it against Everton even better. No, so right, right. People lose to Arsenal <laughs> and do it against Everton. <laughs> <laughs> I ever, oh, tr- uh, trust, trust me, mate. Everton will do all they can not to lose that game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, okay. All right, guys. Um, any any other questions you guys have? Okay with me. Yeah. No, nothing on my side. So, uh, Shazwan, uh, you know, like to really uh, thank you for you know joining us on this show today and uh, you know perhaps, perhaps you want to let our our listeners know like uh, how can they locate you or can they find you you know on your uh, online handles your social media handles or something so that they can get in touch with you so maybe okay. introduce your school a bit where, where, are you, where are you based your yep. school yep. uh, we the Little League Soccer we train across in four locations uh, we hmm. train in Ardens Arena uh, UM Park, the new camp, and then at ISKL Melawati. Hopefully, when everything goes back to normal, we'll be outdoors coaching in the development program as well. Mm-hmm. And if anyone is interested to come out for trials with FC Kuala Lumpur, which is the edit team, uh, we are based at new camp. 
they can reach me on my Twitter at one shazwan six. So that's W A N S H A Z W A N six. I think it's best to reach me across on Twitter, and if there's any queries, I can answer them, or they can email me at shazwan at littleleague.com.my Okay, all right, all right. We'll put the description uh, in, in our episode and you know across all our you know social media channel. Yeah, we will do that. Ah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for that. Appreciate that. Definitely. I mean, of course, uh, uh, on behalf of everybody uh, on the Bola Bola show, we really like to thank you for taking your time uh, on a weekend. You know, able to talk with us. Uh, thank you so much, Aswan. Um, hey, and- no problem. You're welcome. Um, pleasure talking to you guys as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, man. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you for your time as well and your insight. Yeah. No problem. Okay, guys. And with that said, uh, we will end our episode for this week. So, bye for now. <laughs>